It's something every one of us will go through. It can be lonely, painful, unbearable for our loved ones. But what if someone could offer something soothing, something beautiful to help us through it? Tonight, a woman you might call an instrument of change. Here's Edie Magnus with a Dateline Life magazine exclusive. In wintry Montana, where the mountains meet the big sky, another special connection is taking place between music and medicine. A story of the unexpected comfort that comes when the sounds of the harp meet the rhythms of the heart. It is nightfall in Missoula, Montana, and Lyle Rutherford, an 82-year-old patient who's been taken off life support following an irreparable brain injury, is about to die. Go to sleep. Go to sleep, dear. It's all right. You're in God's hands now. Laura, his wife of 27 years, watching quietly at his side. You don't give up easy, do you? So many of us know her pain when modern medicine has done all it can but cannot stop death from taking a loved one. But Laura and Lyle will get some unusual support getting through it all. Improbable as it seems, two women carrying harps down the hospital hallway have come to help. We can be anywhere in the hospital within a very few minutes. You have to be inwardly prepared and inwardly calm. They will play for an hour using their harps and voices to help ease the pain of dying. The music, they say, is personalized to connect with a patient's physical and emotional state. And not surprisingly, it touches the hearts of grieving family members, too. You just had to listen. Maybe this is good. You just forget everything else and you just concentrate on the music. Our work is to help them let go quietly, gracefully, with as little struggle as is possible. The woman who breathed life into the idea of offering these vigils for the dying is harpist Therese schroeder Schieker. We're medically trained, we're musically trained, but really essentially what we're doing is emphasizing the importance of human-to-human -human contact. And it doesn't frighten you being there at someone's moment of death? No, it doesn't frighten me at all. Therese began her career playing music for the living, recording, teaching, and performing worldwide on the harp, an instrument she says she was born to play. She was just a student when the vision about how she might use her talents happened unexpectedly at a Colorado nursing home where she worked part-time. These people were dying heavily medicated and sedated. Most upsetting to Therese, they were dying alone. One elderly man's plight would change her life. She was with him as he died of emphysema. She found him at the very end, struggling and scared. So I just got into bed and held him and sang to him until he died. It was holy to witness somebody's going. I was not the same person. It was the first of more than 2,000 vigils evolving into what Therese now calls the Chalice of Repose Project. Now based at St. Patrick Hospital in Montana, Chalice operates every day, year-round, never charging a fee from patients, the organization funded instead by the hospital and donations. Those who perform the vigils are graduates of a rigorous and lively two-year program, including courses in music, medicine, and spirituality. And if it seems a bit new-agey, Therese says it really isn't new at all. Monks in 11th century France used music, song, and prayer to help the dying achieve what they called a blessed death. Building on its rich past, Chalice today helps patients and their families accept the inevitable instead of fighting against it. Mm -hmm. 
Like a doctor prescribing medicine, she says each vigil is tailored to the specific needs of the patient. Therese calls it prescriptive music. We synchronize the music and the phrasing of our music to the breathing pattern of that person who's suffering. To what degree that suffering is actually alleviated is often a mystery. Many patients are like Lyle Rutherford, unconscious and unable to speak. But Lyle's breathing did change while the chalice members sang and played. We count breaths per minute. He wasn't struggling as much. And he looked like he was more relaxed. And nurse Mary Hearn, who helped take care of Lyle, says the tension lessens dramatically for everyone else in the room. Family members too often neglected by a medical system which focuses solely on the patient. It's hard with the, the monitors and ventilators and um, you know all the bells and whistles going off for people to be able to concentrate on, on what's going on and just to grieve like, like we all need to do. For Laura Rutherford, who'd been keeping watch over her husband for 11 days, waiting for the moment he would take his last breaths, the music provided a welcome release. What this music does, it just kind of embraces you. I kind of felt like I could let go. Let go and hold on to happier memories. Lyle was an ace skier, she told us, a war veteran, a railroad conductor for nearly 40 years. She felt sure he would have wanted it to end this way. And then when I tell him it's, it's all right, I think that gives him peace too, to know that it's all right with me. But I think more than the physiological pain, the interior pain is the one where people need a lot of help. Therese is sensitive to questions about what draws her so often to the bedside of the dying, most of whom are total strangers. Is love so radical? Everybody tries to do something meaningful in the world. How could I not do it if that, in fact, is my small little gift? If you're inclined to be skeptical, the story of these workers with their harps and heavenly sounding voices, helping the dying to go more gently into that great good night here in the mountains of Missoula, may sound a little too sweet. The notion of music as good medicine a little too good to be true. But before you roll your eyes, consider this. The hospital has made a place for this program, not out of the goodness of its heart, but because they've seen it work. In fact, the Chalice of Repose counts among its supporters those most renowned for their skepticism, the doctors. It very much is a part of the experience of practicing cancer medicine in this community. Dr. Stephen Speckert is an oncologist at St. Patrick Hospital. At first, he doubted how much Chalice would have to offer his dying patients. Now, he's its medical director. I can watch this kind of change that begins to occur after the music is being played and have a very strong sense that the anguish and the discomfort that they're having, which includes pain, is relaxed and is softened. Have you actually seen dying patients require less pain medication mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as a result of receiving these vigils? Mm -hmm. We have shown in several cases where the amount of medicine that is required after is significantly less than it was. The power of the vigils to lessen pain proved especially important for one of Dr. Speckert's patients. Her name was Sherry Newton. She was in many ways the most challenging patient I've ever had in oncology. Challenging because Sherry came to Dr. Speckert at age 41 with a recurrence of breast cancer which had spread throughout her body. But she shunned the standard treatments modern medicine has to offer. There would be no chemotherapy. Sherry wasn't going to fight to stay alive. Instead, she sought comfort from the chalice of repose. She wanted to prepare to die. We were just starting to make a life. Sherry and her husband, William, had been married for less than three years. I know she was scared. I think it was more not wanting to leave the people. The couple allowed Life magazine to photograph the many vigils held at Sherry's bedside in the weeks leading up to her death. It was like literally there was a container holding us 
felt like a physical presence. And for everybody involved, these vigils were especially poignant. It was very hard. It was very hard. She was one of our early pioneers. Sherry Newton was a graduate of Chalice, one of the first members, in fact, to help set up the program in Missoula. Therese and the others were playing and singing and saying goodbye to one of their own. It was very difficult to see someone that you adore, that you've laughed and played and cried and struggled and fallen down and had successes and failures with. It was really hard to see somebody you love suffer that much. Even when the experience is less personal, Therese still feels a closeness. Only hours after she played for Lyle and Laura Rutherford, Lyle passed away peacefully. His friends remembered him as a terrific storyteller, an avid outdoorsman. We loved each other and, and that will always be with me. Laura remembered the vigil. While the music was created for Lyle, she felt its effects to be quite profound. She wrote to us, When the harpists were softly playing and singing, I felt God's protective arms around me, and the tension of waiting for death was gradually removed. A lot of the times, Edie, we can do a lot of good. Sometimes we can do a little good. Once in a rare while, we shrug our shoulders and look at each other and say, did we do any good at all? But most of the time, we can really make a difference. And that's as good as any other Department of Medicine. So far, 47 people have graduated from the Chalice of Repose project. They carry on their unique work for the dying in seven states. But Therese schroeder shecker hopes to expand the project across America and around the world. You can read more about the Chalice of Repose project in the December issue of Life magazine. You can also get more information on our website at www.dateline.msnbc.com. Coming up next, Dateline.